Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Welcome to today's SBCMS webinar presentation, Your Patient is Newly Diagnosed with HIV Infection, Next Steps. This is our second in the series of HIV and PrEP lunch webinars. I'm Soteria Cobb, and I'm the membership director for the San Bernardino County Medical Society in partnership with our own nonprofit Inland Wellness Information Network. We are honored to welcome San Bernardino County Department of Public Health. I'm going to introduce our presenter right now, and then following her presentation, we will take your questions and answers. Please enter your name, title, and affiliation in the chat feature, as well as any questions you may have. All questions will be read and answered at the end of the presentation. And of course, if you're not speaking, thanks for keeping your sound on mute. We'd like to welcome Sharon Wang, DOMS, who is currently the Deputy Health Officer, San Bernardino County Department of Public Health, and a well-respected infectious disease specialist. Dr. Wang was previously the Chief of Infectious Disease at Arrowhead Regional Medical Center, ARMC. She graduated from UC Berkeley with her bachelor's and completed training in dietetics at Yale University and finished medical school at Western University of Health Sciences in Pomona, we, where she graduated number five in her class at the same time completing her master's degree in health education. After she received her DO degree, she completed an internal medicine residency and infectious diseases fellowship at the University of California, Davis. She is duly board certified in internal medicine and infectious disease. Dr. Wang is, was a key infectious disease consultant for ARMC's COVID response and treatment program during the pandemic. Dr. Wang, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you so much um, for the introduction and thank you so much for spending the next hour with me. I wish we could meet in person. So if you brush your teeth and brush your hair this morning and you don't mind sh sharing um, your face, you know, feel free to turn on the camera. I promise I won't call on you, but you know, it would just be nice to, um, you know, be, be one step closer to you. And also I like to know um, who my audience is. So if you don't mind putting in your name, um, affiliation and title in the chat room. That way, I, I feel like I know every single one of you. Um, thank you so much. And um, should we start with the poll? I just have a quick poll. Um, so so does everybody know how to do this? Um, so again, these are just Background questions. Um, so the first question is, do you offer an HIV test to all your patients um, 13 years and older? Yes or no? Um, what barriers do you see in starting HIV medications um, in the primary care setting? Is it lack of access to specialists in your area, cost, barriers, patients lack of social support? Are you aware of rapid uh, initiation of ART concept or approach in the primary care setting. And um, after this talk, well, I guess I won't say that. Would you ever consider starting HIV medication in the primary, in your primary care setting um, for a patient who's newly diagnosed? So we'll give 30 seconds and then we'll end mm -hmm. the poll. Oh, great. Most of you do screen for HIV in your setting, and the, act, the barrier to access seems pretty um, even across the common barriers that we see. And um, yes, and most of you will consider starting HIV um, medication in the primary care setting. So hopefully, it'll be 100% after today's talk. So thank you. You guys can see my slide. Okay, great. So just quickly, I'm gonna tell you what I'm gonna tell you today. We're gonna to go over the basic concepts of ending the HIV epidemic. 
Um, quickly, just review on HIV PrEP. We had that lunch series last time by Dr. Diamond. I want to share with you what the current state of STI numbers in our own county. And then, and then the bulk of my talk will be on early HIV initiation in the primary care setting. So, and yes, we're gonna talk about a little bit of medication overview. So taking back to pharmacology and medical school. I'm gonna start with a quick case and just reflect and think about if you have, if you have encountered um, patients like this in your clinical setting. Again, these are real cases that we hear about um, during our bi-weekly uh, um, STI conference. So the first case is a 35-year-old healthy man who was seen in the ER initially for flu-like symptoms. He was diagnosed with COVID and was treated symptomatically and released from the ED. The same patient show up in the ED four months later with again, flu-like symptoms. And this time he was found to be in renal failure and he was admitted for symptomatic management. Um, this particular ED started implementing opt-out testing. So opt-out STI testing that includes HIV, syphilis and hep C screening. So the opt-out is anytime someone comes in that needs a blood draw, this is part of their CBC panel. And it turned out the patient is HIV positive um, and his viral load came back at a, a 10 million. So he was admitted for workup and was discharged. His follow-up discharge instruction was to follow up with his primary care doctor um, to get a referral to see an infectious disease specialist for initiation of HIV medication. So just think about the time, the missed opportunity to diagnose earlier and the potentially missed opportunity to put him on therapy and the potential possibility of more people that he would infect in the interim. The second case is a 52-year-old woman with active meth use, monogamous with a male partner, but the partner is not monogamous, um, inconsistent condom use. Patients show up in the ED for STI complaints. She was diagnosed and treated with gonorrhea appropriately and was released from the ER. Um, based on her risk factor, HIV, chlamydia, and hep C were obtained and they were negative um, in April. Six months later, patient represented to the ER, complained of shortness of breath, headache, leg edema, and she was a medical workup. As part of her lab panel, HIV is now positive and acid syphilis screening. So were there opportunities that missed to potentially link her to HIV prevention and um, in the interim between April to December. So just think about these two patients and we'll come back and revisit them. Why is this a problem? So ending the HIV in the context of syndemic, I don't know, this is a new term I actually learned in the last six months. So syndemic, CDC defines it as a synergistic interacting epidemics. There are multiple epidemics, multiple health threats, all coming, all happening at once. And you can see this. In 2015, HIV and STIs were on the rise. Hep C is in the mix. And um, in 2016, there were Zika, and especially in um, patients with travel history um, and women of childbearing age. HIV didn't go away. Um, and then 2018, we started to have measles outbreak in pockets of under-vaccinated or unvaccinated community. And then we all know in the last three years, we have been dealing with COVID. But HIV didn't go away, syphilis didn't go away. And because of the pandemic, access to care, access linking them to care, linking them to diagnosis are even harder. And then in 2020, to, to add to the mix, we, had, we heard, um, cases of polio, again, in under-vaccinated community, MPOX. Luckily, MPOX is under control, but everything we have been dealing with did not go away. So now this is coming to a head. STI incidence rate per 100,000 in our county compared to California and the rest of the United States. So this blue bar here is chlamydia um, for San Bernardino County, you can see we are we are on par with 
you know, the national average a little bit higher compared to the rest of the California. In gonorrhea, the numbers were, were again consistent with the rest of the rest of the United States. Um, chlamydia, it, there, there's just so many cases of chlamydia. Public health, we track these cases, but we don't investigate them anymore. Same thing with gonorrhea. In our local health jurisdiction, there are so many cases of gonorrhea that we only do contact tracing investigation by hot zone zip code um, because just the, the case burden is just unbelievable. Let me tell you about syphilis. Again, syphilis, everything is on the rise. Congenital syphilis, two, 276 um, cases per 100,000. So congenital syphilis is something that we used to read about in textbooks. I have never seen a case during training, but now it's a common occurrence, um, but it's such a easily addressed and preventable infection, especially in the, um, in, in the, in the um, infant stage. So we have to do something together. And, and I'm so excited that you're all here to hear me talk about STIs for our county. And again, this is just a change between 2020 to 2021, STI, HIV, the numbers are going up, the percent change are going up. Um, we are making a stride with congenital syphilis. Uh, there's actually a 27% drop, but we are still, the case burden is still very high. So what does this mean? How do we compare with the rest of the California? Well, not very good. We are top, we, we've been consistently top 10, top 20 across the board out of 58 local health jurisdiction in STI. So we have to do something different. And yes, Houston, we have a problem. So how can we pull together and solve this problem, move the needle for our county? Going back to the bulk of this talk, and that's why you're here, ending the HIV epidemic. Again, all these are synergistically acting together. So the first pillar, there are four pillars to ending HIV. The first pillar is diagnose all people with HIV infection as soon as possible. And one of the big key to do that is implementing opt-out testing in in your emergency room and your primary care setting. Um, how can we change the system so everybody that gets a needle poke also gets their STI checked? Um, prevent new HIV infection, and that's where education and um, really advocating for PrEP prophylaxis is important. Treating people with HIV um, quickly and effectively. So that's where we're gonna talk about, and then obviously responding to any potential outbreak, offering post-exposure prophylaxis. Again, these are the four pillars in ending the HIV epidemic, and we need your help in doing so. We all have to have a goal, right? Um, we have a project, we have a goal. So the UNAID came up with this 90-90-90 um, goal. This was a 2020 goal. So 90% of all patients living with HIV know their diagnosis. So that's where the opt-out testing is. You need to diagnose them. And of the 90% with the diagnosis, 90% are linked to care and started on HIV medication. And of the 90% on treatment, 90% are fully virally suppressed. So that is the 90, 90, 90 UN AIDS goal. The reality is we're at 84, 73 and 66. So 66% of the patient on treatment are fully suppressed. So that's raise the bar. We can do better. So the 2025 goal is 95, 95, 95. We need to do better. Um, one of the newer public health um, big message, which we didn't, I didn't learn during um, training is U equals U. Um, I hope most of you have heard that before, but HIV viral load undetectable means untransmittable. There's data to support treatment as prevention. So this public health message has to be loud and clear. 
when you interface with someone with HIV or at risk for HIV. And this is a fairly new concept to me um, in the last, in the recent years. So before I say, well, here's the medication you need to start the patient, um, I wanna take a step back and kind of break down, give you a very, very general brief overview of HIV medication, because they are so hard to learn. You have to learn the trade name, the generic name, what they are in the combo pills, the three letter abbreviation. So um, I'm hoping I can make it a little bit easier. So there are eight classes of drugs that are FDA approved. The common ones are the proteus inhibitor, the reverse transcriptase inhibitor, which are, we call them moots and non moots and then the integrase inhibitors. And then you have the other entry inhibitor. The latest drug that was approved, um, it's a capsid inhibitor, and this is a lenacaprovir. It's actually a sub-Q injection that lasts six months. So again, changing the way we address HIV, it's an injectable every six months. Um, so the recommendations for what's first line, they're changing. What we learned 10 to 15 years ago is different than what's the current recommendation. So as of today, the current standard regimen consists of backbone, which is the NRTI, and it's two drugs. And then you pair with the third drug. I used to say it's a dealer's choice, but there's actually a class that's preferred. So I'm gonna walk you through this really quickly. Um, so the nukes, you can see them. The common ones are, they're packaged in a single pill combination as a backbone. So again, I use train name here just because that's what we're familiar with listening. I am not endorsing any of these medications. I just wanna put it out there, but it's easy to see. So a single pill backbone that you're familiar with is intracytamine with tenofovir, the first class for the first generation um, in this class is Truvada. So you may, be, you may hear Truvada, but just to know that that's your backbone. When you see someone with Truvada, make sure you look for a third drug. What is their third drug? Um, and then the newer improved Truvada is your Discovy. They just changed the side chain um, for better um, side effect profile. So, Again, these are some of the common backbone NRTI you are going to see. And again, these have hepatitis B activity as well, just as a side note. The third drug, the preferred third drug is the integrase inhibitor. And again, these are very general generalization. Usually the integrase inhibitor will end with Gravir. Not to be confused with Navir, which is your boosted proteus inhibitor. Um, the boosted proteus inhibitor, this class of drug is not very clean. There's a lot of drug drug interaction, which I'll, I'll emphasize over and over. Um, but the integrase inhibitor, you will see it co-formulated co in a pill with your backbone. And that is your one pill once a day for HIV. Again, this is game changer compared to when HIV was first discovered and patients were on eight, 10 pills multiple times a day. So a common one you will see is Big Chegrevir, core formulated with Discovy, which again is your backbone and it's um, train name, it's Big Tarby. So again, these are some of the common ones. Sometimes you see patient on Truvada or Discovy, again, that's your backbone and, you, and it's typically paired with Dalutegravir. So again, just kind of see it in that context. So um, you make sure it's, it's a sound regimen. And then cabotegravir, that, that one to be used with pulverin, that's your um, long acting injectable um, monthly to um, every other month um, HIV treatment regimen. And then you have the NR, N -N -R -T -I, uh typically ends with um, R-I-N-E. The first one, the first combo pill is a tripla. So a tripla fades you. You know, I, I give this talk to medical students and residents a lot, and none of them heard of a tripla. But I'm sure in this, and I see my friends, you know, from medical school, we all have heard a tripla before, but it fell out of favor because of transmitted resistance. But um, but just to put it out there. So in real life situation, you're going to encounter either newly diagnosed HIV patient or patients who are relinked back to you and or you're in urgent care 
and they come in with a diagnosis of HIV. So what do you do? Usually, sometimes they'll say, I ran out of meds. Your job is to confirm, make sure their regimen makes sense. And if their regimen makes sense, it's a standard two drug regimen backbone with your third drug, it's okay to refill them. Um, enlist your pharmacist to help you. Check their medication bottle, check the last refill pharmacy. A common pitfall that I see in primary care is um, one of the two medications will be refilled. Then you're actually doing the patient a disservice because let's say they recognize Discovy. So they'll refill the Discovy, but they forget, oh, we're the third drug. Or they'll refill the Discovy but, and, and the Proteus inhibitor, but forget the booster. So you just want to make sure the regimen that you are refilling is a complete and a sound one. If you are adding drug because they are coming in for high blood pressure or high cholesterol, make sure you check for drug-drug interaction. If you're going to start then on HIV um, medication, make sure you know your hepatitis B status. Um, and if you're encountering complex cases, when in doubt, call your friendly ID doctors. We are here to help. And if they fell out of care, link them back to care. Okay, this is a really good um, HIV drug interaction checker, but the big classes you wanna consider Rufamycin, so rufampin, rufapentin. You you see that in you know latent TB treatment or um, active TB treatment. The anticonvulsants, the SSRIs, the statins. Again, a, a lot of those will interact with your HIV medications. Even a benign nasal steroid may interact with some of the HIV meds to cause adrenal insufficiency. So you do not want to be that mass scientist to cause more adverse effects for your patient. So just make sure. Any medications you are asked adding to the patient's regimen to um, do a drug or interaction check. So here is um, a very common scenario. You put the kids to bed. Now you open your computer. You're checking your inbox. You're doing your notes. You're catching up for the day. And you, you're reviewing labs. And this pops up for your patient, HIV screening and confirmation positive or HIV viral load. You take a deep breath and said, okay, what do I do? I have a newly diagnosed patient. Or maybe you had expected it and you weren't so surprised. So what do you do? The second pillar of ending the HIV epidemic is linking them to care, but starting them on HIV rapidly and effectively. Our patient, patient scenario number one, that's walking around with the HIV viral load of 10 million, that patient is getting linked to care, but he didn't get started rapidly with HIV diagnosis. So the World Health Recommendation actually recommends starting or offering HIV medication within seven days of diagnosis, regardless of CD4 count. Some even say recommend same day or within 72 hours. Um, and the reason is there are data to support morbidity and mortality benefits regardless of their CD4 count. And this is a grade one, a recommendation. So yes, the clock is ticking. We've got to start them on medication safely. Um, rapid ART diagnosis. So why? What's the urgency? Treatment upon diagnosis, why do we do that? There are many benefits to it. The big one is decrease your overall HIV viral reservoir. So when you're acutely infected, you have high vir viral load circulating in your, in, in your circulation, and they're looking for places to settle. They're looking for the lymph nodes, your lymphatic system to settle. If you can stop that replication, if you can decrease the viral load before they settle into your system, you actually decrease the patient's total viral reservoir. That will have health benefits such as decreased anti-inflammatory um, anti effect or in, you, it, you decrease the total inflammatory effect for the patients. That leads to improvement in cardiovascular, re renal, and hepatic health. You decrease their time to viral suppression. The quicker you drop their viral load, you start them on a medication, the quicker they're, they're going to get to that undetectable. And as a result, you decrease onward transmission. 
Um, there are also studies that show patients who are started on HIV medications right away at the time of diagnosis, there's actually better linkage and retention to care. You got this patient fresh. They're going to stay in care. They're more likely to stay in care. And it is the standard of care. The other thing is the higher their CD4 is at the time of HIV medication initiation, the higher their CD4 count recovery will be. So there are so many benefits to why this is important in ending the HIV epidemic. Yes, it's urgent, but of all the people that need to be started on medication, the group that are most urgent with pregnant patients, we'll talk about that. Patients coming in with acute HIV, their viral load are through the roof. Um, I'm not gonna say elderly because I'm close to over age 50, but over age over 50, for some reason, you will progress faster. And patients coming in with advanced disease. The clock is ticking even faster for these patients. So you have to link, start them and link them to care. As a clinician, so what is your role when you see that, you know, red HIV positive, um, when you bring these patients in to see them, take a good history and physical um, to form a decision about starting an um, HIV medication, assess the patient's readiness. Maybe some patients, they're in denial, they're just not ready yet. Um, identify any barriers to adherence and there will be barriers, access to medications, supportive services. Maybe there are other competing psychosocial social factors that prevent them from taking care of their own health, active substance use, mental health disorders. Identify what support services they may need and what barriers there are for them to be successful in um, addressing their HIV. Take a good history. Um, results of the last HIV test, previous use of antiretro medication, were they ever um, on PrEP or PEP for HIV, and a focused review of system. This is really important because you want to rule out acute retrovirus syndrome, and you also want to rule out for any concurrent opportunistic infection. Sexual history, the serous status of their partners. So sexual history is really important. Believe it or not, every HIV case, the public health, the Department of Public Health has a case worker on it. And we actually look through your notes, your very detailed sexual history notes. We collect those data. We help with contact tracing, reaching out to the partner. So the more you provide in your HPI related to their sexual history, the, the, the the better we can serve your patient. Additional counseling, um, I usually go over, you know, the basic education, again, very brief, what HIV means to you, the viral load, the resistance, and how much you disclose just depends on the readiness of this patient. But the most important thing is you are their cheerleader, you are there for them. I tell them, I usually will try to equate it to a chronic disease that they know. I ask them, do you know, do you have family members with high blood pressure, diabetes, kidney disease, where they have to go to, you know, to wash their kidney, to go to dialysis unit, equated to a chronic condition that they may have heard. And I tell them, this is no different than a chronic condition that you have to live with, um, but it's so easy to manage. As soon as you see your doctor on a regular basis every month to every three months, eventually once a year, you take a pill, one pill once a day, you are going to live a healthy life compared to anybody without a disease. So remove that stigma. This is not a gay disease. This is not a disease you're going to die with. This is not a disease that will stop you from achieving what you want in life. You are their first point of contact. You are their cheerleader. Set the tone from the get-go and then go, go over the benefit of why we want to start treatment and then give them, give them hope. Tell them you need to stay healthy and be on medication long enough for us to see if there's cure. We're closer, there's no cure right now, but we're closer to a cure than we were 20 years ago when we first learned about HIV. And then tell them there, there are shots in the future once you're suppressed, there are shots that you can consider like a depot shots for, um, as the treatment and then really stress the importance of 
strict adherence. Once you start, you know, resistance will develop if you go on and off the medication. And then, you know, part of the sexual practice, safe sexual practice and also safe needle sharing activity. And then really emphasize again, treatment is prevention. You equals you. You need to protect your loved ones. You need to protect everybody around you. So you need, this is a, another, it may be a motivation for some patients to take that pill one pill once a day. Um, but most importantly, discuss expectations. You may have side effects. You may gain weight. You may not feel good taking these medications, but I'm here to help you. There are many, many different medication options. It's not just one pill. And that's it, if you throw up, that's it. That's not the case. Tell them we can change it up. We're here to make sure they're on a regimen that is tolerable for them. Tell them you may feel worse before you get better. Some people will have immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome. So it may actually unmask an underlying infection that they didn't know they have when, um, before they were on medication because Again, you don't want to make that association, well, HIV pills make me sick. And that could be the barrier that this patient will never want to be on treatment again. So again, set the expectation. You may feel worse before you get better. Um, housekeeping, standardized lab tape. A, a, a lot of, again, you can bill an order set to standardize this, you, and you don't need to get the results back before you hand them that prescription. So um, I'm gonna break it down into three big classes. Again, the HIV specific labs. We know HIV viral load, quantitative viral load, CD4 count, and, and genotype. Genotype is very important. Make sure you send that before they start taking their pill because that might be the only chance you are going to catch a resistance. So you don't need to get the results back, but make sure it's, it's drawn and cooking in the lab. Um, health maintenance, um, all the health maintenance um, activities, labs that you monitor, kidney, liver, lipid, pregnancy, urinalysis, um, you will do that. And then STI testing and HIV specific comorbidities. You want to know your patient's hepatitis A, B, C status. If they're B infected, they need to be on a regimen that, that treats B. If they're hep A not immune, you need to vaccinate them and hep C um, their hep C needs to be treated. Again, we have cure for hep C. Um, that's for future talk, but you need to know their hepatitis status, but you don't need to know this um, when they start their, their first day of pill, but just to have these cooking. Um, urine, uh, site-specific gonorrhea testing, um, throat, rectal, urine, and chlamydia as well. And there are some other optional labs that usually your HIV clinician will get them. So fill it into orders. What I do with the viral load and the CD4 count, uh, again, it's empowering the patient. I actually, I usually just write it down on an index card. I don't put their name on there and I just write the dates. This is your starting viral load. And the next time they come in, I ask them, hey, take out your index card and we update it. And you can see their viral load dropping within two or four weeks of starting medication. And it is so rewarding for the patient and for you as a doctor, well, at least for me as a doctor, when I see, the viral load dropping dramatically, and the patients can see that too. They are rare contraindication to start HIV medications right away. And there are two conditions that you need to remember, cryptomeningitis and TB meningitis. These are the two opportunistic infections that the risk of starting them on HIV medication right away before these conditions are treated will outweigh the benefit. You may kill the patient um, due to uh, brain herniation because of the, the massive inflammatory response they're going to have. So these two conditions, and that's where the focus review system and, and physical is very important because you want to make sure there's no signs and symptoms suggestive of meningitis, headache, nausea, vomiting, light sensitivity, change in mental status. If that's the case, then do not start them on an HIV medication. You want to send them to the ER to be admitted, to be worked up for these um, potentially life-threatening meningitis. What about ART consideration in the setting of other commonly seen opportunistic uh, conditions? So 
in non-tuberculosis, in non-CNS tuberculosis, if their CD4 count is robust over 50, then you have time to introduce HIV medication. Make sure they tolerate their TB regimens first before you introduce HIV medication. And make sure you involve your HIV, your ID specialist, because there are so many drug interactions with the TB medication and HIV medications. Other AIDS-associated conditions, um, malignancy, KS, PML, crypto, um, sporeido uh, crypto sporeidosis, you want to get them on medications to, to improve their immune system ASAP. That way they can fight these um, opportunistic conditions. Nemocystis pneumonia, we still see them very, fairly often in the county hospital. Again, these patients, you want to start them on HIV medication, preferably before they're discharged from the hospital. Um, usually you wanna start them once they are stable and tolerating their PJP um, antibiotics and their steroids if needed. So what are some of the common regimens that I recommend? So again, um, repetition. So a common one is Big Tarvi, which is your, it has your backbone Discovy, so your backbone nukes with TAF-FTC, plus your third drug, which is um, Bictegravir, and this is formulated into one pill. So it's one pill once a day. I tell a patient, I'm gonna put you on one pill once a day, and this pill will save your life, which you do like. Um, other combination, again, they, if for some reason they, they cannot be on the one pill once a day, there are other combination, but again, the concept is the same. Backbone new, two drugs, backbone new, plus a third drug. Intergrace inhibitor is preferred. Again, drug drug interaction, call your ID. Most of us are happy to help. Um, most of us are overworked, but we are so happy to help. And um, special population, pregnant patients, renal insufficient patients, co-infected patients with hepatitis, um, liver failure patients, call your ID doctor. And just don't forget to have that genotype cooking before you start on medication. But again, you don't need to have the results back. If they were on a integrase inhibitor before, so like a long acting cabotegravir as front, then you want to make sure you check for integrase resistance, which is called integrase genotype. If they were on the integrase inhibitor class of drug before. Um, again, repetition, there are guidelines out there. I didn't make this up. It's the NC plus two drug regimen. Um, the drugs that you want to avoid as part of your initial start, again, the N NRT class, the triplet class, the repovering. Um, and the reason is there are high enough of transmitter resistance. So I wouldn't recommend that as your first line unless you have resistance um, information in front of you. Um, Abacavir, it's, a, it's a one of the backbone drugs that needs the HLA B5701 testing prior to starting. So you wouldn't be starting this in your initial primary care setting. Two drug regimen, even though it's written on one of as an option for preferred regimen, there, there are nuances to choosing a two drug regimen to start, such as their initial viral low, their hepatitis status, and their suspected drug resistance. So if you're really considering a two drug regimen, this should be done. It's best to be done by your um, friendly local ID doctors or HIV specialists. Um, pregnant consideration, um, right? Everything is a shared decision making with the patient, but the clock is ticking faster. You need to put them on um, HIV regimen to reduce the vertical, the risk of vertical transmission. Again, with vertical transmission, HIV is lifelong for their infants. Similar initial regimen, again, it's your backbone plus your third drug. The third drug could be your INSTI or it could be a protease inhibitor, but please, involve your HIV specialist and your maternal fetal medicine specialist um, as soon as possible. This is not a patient you discharge without having a firm linkage to care. Okay. Patients who were previously on PrEP or they were exposed and they were actually on PEP. Again, this is where taking a good history comes in. Um, if patient were 
previously on the injectable, you want to get the genotype again. Um, if there is concern for resistance and you really want to start them, you can actually put them on a four drug regimen. We call it a reinforced ART regimen. So it's the same as what we, we had talked about your backbone, Nuke, which is two drugs, plus Dorutegravir, which is your INSTI, that's your preferred third drug plus your boosted darunavir. That's a four drug reinforced regimen in someone with prior concern for prior resistance before you get their genotype back. And of course you want to, you can always change it based on the genotype. Or just call your lovely HIV specialist. Um, so the goals, at, again, this is a lot of information, but the goal at in initial ART intake is, again, providing that support, setting the stage, help them link to care, insurance, enrollment, optimization. Um, they are drug assistance programs out there. Make sure you get the baseline lab and then give them their prescription. Um, some places will actually have a seven-day starter pack, um, and that would be actually ideal. Some patients, they're not ready yet. Um, they are in that denial phase, but that's okay. Make sure someone in your clinic follow up with them within one to two weeks. We offer education, we offer HIV regimen um, starting and benefits of starting. Um, additional consideration for the ones that you have started, um, ideally you would have someone from your clinic reach out to them a few days afterwards, let them know we're here for them, make sure there's there's no problem in getting their HIV medication from the pharmacist, from the pharmacy, and then that they're tolerating well, and that they're actually on uh, consistent with the pill take. Um, this could this doesn't have to be you. It could be your educator in your clinic, social worker, community health workers. If you are in the process of hiring community health worker because it's a Medicare benefit now, this is something that they potentially can do. Um, they are tons of HIV-related HIV education and support groups out there. They're not alone. Um, healthy living with HIV, there's a lot of information on CDC, CDPH, and on, on um, HIV um, foundations. You want to make sure you bring them back in clinic at least monthly for follow-up until they're suppressed. And then refer also in the process, refer them to see an HIV specialist for a longitudinal follow-up. Um, now that they're on treatment, there is time to get them to the specialist. So I'm going to pause. Just going back to our case number two. The patient was diagnosed with gonorrhea um, in April, and then six months later presented with acute HIV. So patient acquired HIV in their intra. What could have been done? Um, what could have been done um, to prevent this? So if we are, remember going back to the four pillar, if we're serious about ending the HIV epidemic, it has to include PrEP, it has to include prevention, and it has to include you. You have to be part of the equation. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. There are studies that that show in a community with high HIV PrEP uptake, such as um, San Francisco, Seattle, there is a dramatic reduction in HIV rate. So we have to push HIV PrEP. Um, the population at risk for HIV infection, the lifetime risk in MSM, men who have sex with men, one in six lifetime of HIV acquisition, and you can see the numbers going down depending on their, their risk factor. So this, the risk is real. CDC says this is your core primary care service. PrEP as an option, the information needs to be offered to every sexually active adult and adolescent um, should have information on this. And this will, you know, words get around, increase knowledge among the potential users in the community. There are quick guidelines that can help clinicians in the primary care, set, care setting set up for HIV PrEP. How good is PrEP? It is so good. 
99% reduction in HIV acquisition if you take it consistently, effectively within 70 day, seven days of anal receptive sex, 21 days for vaginal receptive sex. And it's even effective in IV drug using community, there's a 74% reduction in um, getting HIV in this community. So it is very, very effective in preventing HIV. Who qualifies? Anybody who asks for it qualifies, um, but especially patients who are sexually active with an HIV partner or anybody who you are seeing for an STI, patient had syphilis, patient had gonorrhea, PrEP should come to you, your mind as long as there's no concern for acute HIV infection. Condomless sex with partners of unknown status or desire to family plan with a partner who is HIV positive. Um, the IV drug using community, people who share injection equipment, again, PrEP needs to be in the conversation with the patient. Um, who, who's eligible as long as they have a negative HIV test within one week, there's no signs and symptoms of acute infection, flu-like symptoms, um, things like that, normal renal function, and um, there's no contraindication to the medications that are recommended. And of course, part of the PrEP education is safe sex, condom use, and other as, um, risk reduction methods. What's on the menu? Again, the endorse recommendation is the daily approach. Again, this goes back to our backbone, NRTI, your Truvada or your Discovy. So again, if you see this on a medication list for a new patient, either they're taking it for PrEP or they have HIV and you look for that third drug. So um, that, that gives you a clue. There is the 221 on demand PrEP, kind of like taking Viagra before sex, but this is not FDA approved. Um, approved, nor in CDC endorsed, but just so you know, it's out there. You take it um, two pills before sex, and then a pill after, and then a pill after uh, 24 hours after that. Um, the latest one that was approved uh, recently is the injectable, injectable every two months. So patients come in every two months for HIV prevent for their for their um. So, uh, for their, um, I think it's intramuscular injection. And again, these are approved for renal failure patients as well. So they are options and we can help you set it up. What can public health do for you? So we can help link to care once they're diagnosed. If they don't have a primary care doctor, we can do STI education for your patients, for your um, staff. We can, we can do HIV disclosure with you. We can, we can provide you with the guidance on how to do that. HIV PrEP referral, if your clinic, um, we can help you navigate the whole HIV PrEP system. Um, syphilis, we can help you mine data, historical data. We all know treating syphilis depends on, also depends on their previous titer and treatment. We can help with, with that. We have a database at our disposal to provide you with, the medic, with their history. We can do contact tracing, partner treatment. We can do the uncomfortable conversation to tell the patient's partners that they're being infected with STI, that they need treatment. We will even do syphilis treatment for your patients that are at very high risk, such as a pregnant patient who can't come to your clinic. Or, and we also will provide you with Visalin if your clinic it doesn't stock them. We will bring the treatments to you. Um, and here's our 1-800 number, or you can always reach out to your friendly deputy health officer. And that is me. So please, um, the collaboration between public health and you is endless. We are here to support you, and we are here to ask you to help us move the needle on the STI epidemic in our county. Um, that's all I have, and I haven't been monitoring the chat room, so um, mm -hmm. unmute yourself if you have question. Again, this is meant to be interactive. And then just one last plug for Dr. Chirao. So our next series of um, lunchtime webinar is Primary Care Provider Guide to Hepatitis C Treatment. And Dr. Chirao is the chief of GI over at USC. So she'll be spending an hour lunchtime with us, um, giving us an overview on addressing Hep C treatment in the primary care setting. So that's it from me, and um, I'm happy to take any questions.
Thank you so much, Dr. Wang. That was fantastic. Does anyone have any questions? I do see just a couple in the chat right now. Um, the first one is, uh, can you cover the uh, medication costs? Yeah, so the medication costs, um, I wish I asked my pharmacist to be on this call, but <laughs> typically they're covered. So this is what I always tell the patients that um, once you're diagnosed with HIV, medication costs should never be a barrier. Um, if they have insurance, there might be copay. Medi-Cal usually covers it. And if they, they do not have insurance, there's um, uh, ADAP, AIDS Drug Assistance Program. There's Ryan White Program that will supplement drug costs. So drug costs should never be a barrier to treatment. And if that is, we can, we can figure it out together. Um, that's a really good question. Some of the newer, like the injectable, potentially may have a higher drug cost, but they are assistance programs for that as well. Great question. Oh, wonderful. Are all ART drugs on Medi-Cal IHP formulary? Um, that is, that I'm not sure. Um, if anybody else on the, on the call knows that answer, feel free to unmute and um, share with us. But I'm gonna, I, I'm, I'm gonna research that. Perfect. And how about, how do I best educate my family med clinic colleagues in, um, referencing importance of testing and starting treatment rapidly? Um, so how, how do you, how do you stress the importance mm -hmm. of testing? Um, I have a whole section on um, opt-out testing. I'm happy to come to your clinic and educate your medical staff leadership. Um, it is endorsed by CDC, CDPH recommending opt-out testing. So you can't address an issue if you, if you don't test. Um, so that's the importance. And again, um, I, I would just, usually the best way to remove the stigma is this is part of testing. There is no longer a special consent that's needed for HIV testing. This is part of this is part of the, you know, usual health maintenance um, care, right? And and I, I normalize by saying I'm going to check your blood for CBC for chemistry. I'm going to check your kidney, check your blood count, check your liver, check check your um, HIV, syphilis, hepatitis C just to make sure. Again, you it's part of the routine care. And, and it, it's not based on any specific risk factors. Um, I was talking to one of um, the ID doctor who used to be, um, who, who used to work in Detroit and she actually, uh, she actually worked with the office of registrar and just sent out um, free STD testing in public health clinic to everybody. And again, it's just addressed to current residents. It doesn't address to any names so again. Um, there, there are ways to really normal, normalize this. And again, um, targeted ads help to on, um, on social media. We are actively trying to reach out to community colleges. We are in the process of bringing an STI mobile van. Um, so if you host events and you want us to come out and offer free testing, um, that's something we certainly can do. So really just to, it's, it's really just education. Um, and normal, normalize, you know, STI. There's, there's no stigma. Those are great oh, questions. Oh, wonderful. Well, that's all that I show in the chat. Does anybody else have any other questions? Just raise your hand and we'll unmute you. Okay, I don't see anything. Well, thank you again, Dr. Wang and the San Bernardino County Public, the San Bernardino County Department of Public Health. And we also want to encourage everybody to continue to check our SBCMS Facebook page and our website for updated announcements on different webinars. And again, stay tuned for our upcoming webinar, including hepatitis C in the primary care setting on March 15th. This is, as you know, being recorded and everyone that has attended or participated today will receive an email with the slides as well as a copy of the, the recording. So. 
just want to say thank you everyone for attending and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. And I hope to meet every single one of you in person someday. Come on down. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Wang.